Kayfabe Weekly Shoot 48. My name's Ed Piscor. I'm Jim Rugg. Jim, what day is it, dude? January 9th, 2020. I have to keep writing the 2020, Ed, because <laughs> that is a whole new... I, I always mess up dates and years anyway when we flip over the calendar, but 2020 is a big one, so uh, January 9th. Do you ever hear uh, recently they put out the, the, the warning that you should uh, write out the full 2020 on your checks uh, when you <laughs> send in bills? Because if you put the two zero, like they could put the date as, as anything, backdated as anything. Uh, I don't know that that's a big deal, but like... I write so few checks now. I think I've seen one person in a supermarket write a check in the last year, and it was like a dinosaur spot, you know, like <laughs> sighting or something. Like, what is this that this person has? You know what? One time that I do uh, absolutely sign checks, uh, I did it today. Tax time, man, mm, for, for the last right. thing. And I almost forgot it. So there's a lot of makers out there, a lot of freelancers out there, man. January 15th is that Q4 2019 tax. Get that shit out there, man. Yes. I uh, I have one thing to say that sort of like piggybacks off of uh, off of a conversation we had last week, man, where I was talking about like the crazy dreams I had, dude. <laughs> For the first time in my 37 years on this planet, this is for Rick Beach, by the way. <laughs> yeah, uh, this past week I've done something for the first time ever, dude. I woke myself up in the middle of screaming. Holy shit, man. <laughs> yeah. Like I woke up as ah ah and 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 like started thinking like I hope that wasn't that loud. Like like when I was sleeping, I hope the scream that came out wasn't super loud. My throat hurt. Uh I don't know, man. I uh, this comic is 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 hard wow. Yeah, that's tough. That is uh, <laughs> that's a warning sign, my friend. <laughs> I I roomed with somebody on the road at a comic book convention that had night terrors. And then I had night terrors whenever he woke up like screaming and gasping and stuff. It was a uh it was alarming. <laughs> not a not a even being warned that it might happen, it was not a pleasant thing to witness. Yeah, no, it was it was fucked up. Now I I'm not going to say that uh, it, it'll be a regular thing, but uh I do have to put myself my mind into a place man for this comic <laughs> and it's uh <laughs> Maybe I cursed myself bringing it up on the Cafe Weekly this past time. Boy, that's tough, Ed. Anytime, like I always think when I get near an end of a book, it really becomes like 24 hours. And that's where it, I'm Like at. you're dreaming about it, all that stuff. And But you have several more issues. Yeah. And who knows, maybe more volumes. Like, wow, this could... I wonder if you can rewire like your 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 brain this way, you know, by by putting this much, concentrating on a subject this much, where you're watching reference, you're thinking about it, you're reading about it, you're making it like... That's a lot of brain activity. Yeah, and, and it's like, I I can't, I have to go with my whimsy. And it just so happens that my my mind was going to this place. <clears throat> and I and this is the comic that I have to make. Like, I can't just, I can't just um, chase the dollar. Kind I, of hey, thing. man, I appreciate it as a reader. Yeah. <laughs> but, but, but what a tool. <laughs> we'll see. We'll see, man. Hopefully not. It's fun that, that we uh, that we have these conversations that you can sort of record this. Uh, My I downward think... spiral? <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> but it's it's fun to see it, man. It's, uh, yeah, it's, well, well I guess we'll, we'll, you keep us posted on this. It's a little I, bit of the shining in Jack Nicholson, right? Of like It's very cold outside. Yeah, I was going to say, like, maybe <laughs> getting out and getting some sunshine will help counteract some of this. Sunshine. <laughs> Pittsburgh in fucking January. A little bit gray out there, but... <laughs> We had, but I but you know this past week provided some palate cleanser. That that was sort of my segue to get you to a place. Absolutely, what a pleasurable week of comics reading for me. We're we're, we're we read the Comics Journal uh, Bill Watterson interview this yeah. week. We're going to talk about that after we wrap this up, which of course is the rabbit hole of then reading a bunch of Calvin and Hobbes. Everybody should do this. You know, like there are these different things of like go exercise, take a walk every day, listen to classical music, these things to make you put you in a better mood or whatever. Read Calvin and Hobbes. If you're, you know, if you're a comics fan, make that a daily part of your routine because wow, what what a pleasurable week. I would go to bed at night after reading these just in the happiest, best spirits and thinking like tomorrow I'm going to read this book. Right. You know, this next Calvin and Hobbes <laughs> book or whatever. Um it's been a while since I've had this kind of reaction. There's lots of comics I read that I get excited. I'm engaged. You know, they're they're beautiful. But for the sheer pleasure, I mean, it's I, I don't know the last time I've read comics and just felt this good afterwards. 
Were you uh, a fan growing up? Like, did it influence you when you were a kid? Not really. I did not really read comic strips growing up no. uh, too much. Maybe a collection here or there, maybe a far side or something. You know, I think I've said it before on this channel, the only comics I could find in my library were like Garfield reprints. So I was conscious of this stuff, but that's not where my interests were. And riding over here, I was thinking today about like what the difference between comic artist and cartoonist is. You know, and I think a lot of it is, you know, it's writing. It's, it's sort of the story creative, I think, is what you would add to a comic book artist to get into cartoonist mode. And because I was reading comic books so much as a kid, I was just looking at like penciler. That's what I want to be. Yeah. And thinking in that mindset as opposed to like reading all of this stuff or, or thinking about, you know, like daily strips were very different from, say, image comics in the early 90s. And so I was aware of them, but it wasn't a, a regular part of my reading and it wasn't aspirational to me at that time. Now it's all I want to do, man. That uh, when when I like reacquaint myself with that four panel structure. It is all that I want to do. I, I want to like reformat like, you know, the next piece of my comic to just fit into these four panel beats and shit. And that is on the bucket list, man. Like, like as, as things continue, the royalty checks, they keep coming in. That gives you room to play. And there is going to be a year where I make, it'll be a book but it'll be in the format of four page strips. And then I was thinking about like, well, I liked far side too growing up, man. Now, now I clipped this stuff. Like my, we got both papers in town. A uh, one, we got the, the, the one just, just for the comics. Cause they had the stuff that did the other paper didn't. And my parents were, were like, cool like that, you know? So I, I had um scrapbook and would save many strips, but it was a uh, far side and Calvin and Hobbes that were like the last great, comic strips yeah and well cartoons in the in the in, when talking about far side but that single panel thing is so difficult for my mind to wrap itself around that i want to try that for maybe six months or a yeah. year at some point well i'm on board for all these experiments ed yeah. <laughs> please do all these things i it, it is exciting to see that different approach and when you talk about making a book like i thought a lot about um the paperbacks, you know, like like the Peanuts paperbacks are the ones that come to mind first. But in in reading some of the Watterson stuff, he talks about Pogo and encountering Pogo in that in that like you know pocket sized paperback format. I'm sure everybody's familiar with that, and I love that format so much. And it's interesting to even think about creating new work that would follow certain comic strip ideas in terms of you know the way you approach it and put it together and think about it, write it, all that stuff. But then packaging it in that paperback format, you know, like there's so many options that we have now. And I love that format. So it'd be cool if somebody did like a retro Calvin and Hobbes paperback collection in that format. You know, as, as much as that work has been in print and read and, and continues to be popular, it'd be kind of cool to see it in that format where you're sh shifting your panels around, you know, to get like one above the other and one above the other, you know. Oh, that would make you nuts, man. <laughs> well, I mean, you don't only do it with this consent, but, but he talks about that format a little bit in some of these interviews and it's like... It is kind of cool. You know, it's a little bit of a lost format. Chester Brown did it with that most recent collection of the Playboy. And it's just like, oh, genius. Yeah. You know, it's such a, it, it's so evocative of a certain time period. And if, if you're doing anything that's a little bit retro, it's like the format itself gives you some of that nostalgia. Should we uh, segue right into your Charles Manson comic after all this <laughs> fluffy talk? Sure. <laughs> um, I, I think we've mentioned it before. My wife's away this week, which means a little extra free time for me. And uh, and I happen to have a short comic past my desk at right the perfect time. Um, so it's a Charles Manson comic, you know, set in 1969. And uh, it, it's uh, a little outside of the stuff I usually do, but very fun to draw this week. Um, I'm... I'm at a little bit of a holding pattern in one of my other projects. So like I said, all the timing worked out great. And it's I like doing short stories because it allows me to like, oh, try a little different style here. And uh, I mentioned on one of my posts, you know, thinking about like the Skywald publications, the uh, the 70s black and white horror magazines. Um, it's Warren probably being the top of the mountain of that stuff, but lots of imitators. And so that was kind of what I was thinking of and drawing it. And it, it was it was fun to do that, to kind of try some different skill sets, some different tools, some different approaches than what I usually draw. And so uh, that, that was kind of a fun thing this week. I streamed a couple of those, um, had some great people drop in, some fun conversations, talked about lettering for half an hour, I think, on one of them, which uh, I'm sure some people were just scratching their chins like, what are we what are we doing here? 
But uh, yeah, it was it it's was a good week. channel, man. Like our channel's built for this, man. The beauty of the internet is that uh, niches find niches and prosperity abounds. You know what I'm saying, man? Like uh, if if there's a thousand people who are into it, man, you're going to do all right. So so we've we're creating that community. Uh, a community that doesn't exist in the comic book realm, man. There's a lot of dumb chit chatter, but this is the place to come for those those uh, in the weeds kind of conversations, man. And I was I was watching the stream and enjoying myself a lot, trying to imagine like what is this finished piece going to look like. And I saw something on your Instagram that you like Skywald. You you are going for that kind of like ink wash. Uh, aesthetic and one of the things I wanted to ask you because you know you're a technical genius when it comes to the the, the production <laughs> like when, when it head. comes yes I am yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> in uh in you know preparing the files for in the computer and all that and I wonder what you have in mind like what are the thoughts in mind when you're doing like an ink wash piece and, but you know that it's go you know it's projected on a monitor and how do you prepare that for paper because that's two separate visuals really yeah i was thinking about that on the way over here because i, I need to like finalize the files and mm -hmm. send them off and i have to figure out if it's on code, coded stock or uncoded and uh the difference that makes for anybody at home is that there's uh what's called dot gain on uncoded there'd be more dot gain and this is when the ink hits the paper it spreads a little bit so if you have a black dot that black dot's a little bit bigger if you have a ten thousand black dots it's much darker um so Whenever I make this stuff, if it looks right on screen, I usually adjust my levels in Photoshop to make it a little bit brighter and it doesn't look right on screen. And you just kind of have to accept, you have to have faith in that from like having printed a bunch of stuff and realize like this is about the setting. So um, that's what I'll do for it, uh, especially if it's on an uncoded stock where I know it's going to print a little bit darker than what I, how it looks, what I've been staring at. Um, that's, a, that's something we'll probably get into because there are some specific comics that I'm familiar with that have versions of this and that have been printed and shown on screen and stuff so you can kind of compare and contrast. Um, I used to make files for print and I would do two sets of files, one for digital display and one for the print printed version because I knew they would print darker. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and just from like printing a lot of stuff myself, I would kind of figure out those levels and you know, it, it became a normal step in my process. Um, but that is the thing I, I think about when I'm sending this stuff off, especially with the washes because Man, anybody that's looked at that black and white, you know, that, that stuff is really great, all the creepy and worn stuff, but the reproduction is so all over the map. It's easy for that stuff to be too dark, you know, for all the washes to kind of look the same dark gray. And then you'll see originals and it's like, this is a whole different piece. We see it with some of the manga. When we went through the Lone Wolf and Cub manga and we were looking at some of the printed pieces and some of the originals, the comparison was, you know, it's worlds apart. So you think about it, you do the best you can. Um, you know, but it is a kind of, it's hard to compare screen and print or, or to, you know, clearly anticipate. And that's why you get proofs. You know, it's the only way to really know for sure. Can uh, we get just a little bit deeper in the weeds with this with this uh, piece from a technical aspect? Will the black line be 1200 DPI and the gray line be, I mean, the, the ink wash be 600 DPI? That's how I have it set up right now. Like I said, I haven't finalized the files, but that's probably what I will do. Yeah, and and the value of that would be... So the value of that is, if it's a, a grayscale file, this is a question of grayscale versus bitmap. Mm -hmm. So the 1200 DPI bitmap for line art, what you get is a very sharp line. If you go with the grayscale, most programs do an anti-aliasing, which is they try to make those lines blend, you know, um, which works really well in color. It does not work as well for a line. It works great in the gray, like the wash, you, you want that, you know, it kind of makes it soft, especially yeah. the edges or where things are gradients or anything like that. So it works really well. But if you do it with the line art and you look at the line art closely, you'll see little dots on the edges of the lines. It's kind of fuzzy and, yeah. and it's it's small. At this point, these printers are outputting at a very high resolution. So you kind of have to look close. Most readers aren't going to it's, it's not going to make a difference, um, but it makes a difference if you're if you did it and then you're looking at it and be like, how did this print? Um, that's when it shows up. And that's what it is. You'll see, and you can find lots of examples of this. You know, I'm sure if you have black and white comics at home, and, and you can just pull out a couple, and you'll see some differences. Right. If it's shot, you know, like in the old days, it would be shot from the line art. You get a nice crisp edge. Once you start scanning that, and then sending off grayscale and bitmap files, that's where you started to see the anti-aliasing. So, the bitmap prevents that. Yes, and and uh, it's like in my mind, the rule of thumb is 
if you have those thick to thin like sharp lines it's got to go bitmap it has to like like charles burns you know yeah. the, the greatest of, of the inkers that does that precise beautiful lines you have to print those with that sharp edge intact yeah and and you know uh chris Ware mm -hmm. does that like using color the black line is 1200 dpi very sharp precise ink lines with the maximum output of a color file is going to be 300 dpi like that that hasn't changed no in the past it really hasn't years. I learned all this stuff. Jordan Crane, who's a uh, used to do an anthology called Non, he's been published by Fanographics. Very good cartoonist, very technical. Like he does a lot of screen printing, so reproduction, scanning, all that stuff. He's a genius at it. I'm I'm a I'm a I'm an acolyte, you know. <clears throat> he did a uh, he he made a PDF, and this would have been in like the early 2000s. We'll look at that sometime because I I it's made my Bible. I, I printed one out and, and like made a mini comic of it. But it was a reproduction guide. I think it was even called re reproduction repro guide or something yeah yeah it's still floating around if you if you type in uh uh something like like red ink red reading k or reading yeah, yeah. one red word ink. type in david show brian ralph jordan crane pdf yeah ron Reggie is in it it was like he had contacted a bunch of his his uh people that he worked with on non other cartoonists at the time who all had some area of expertise so there are there are chapters on photocopying which I think is David Cho and is pretty amazing. There's chapters on screen printing. I used to screen print and that's where I learned, you know, like that was one of the resources for that. Um, but also Jordan Crane does scanning line art. Starts on page 14. <laughs> <laughs> and I still use those same settings and that same guideline. So uh, it, it's amazing. You know, th that's definitely a resource to go check out if you're interested in this kind of stuff. And if we can find it, maybe we'll po post a link or put it in comments or something like that. It makes total sense if David Cho is the photocopy guy, because like some of the things that he says is like, put on a suit. <laughs> and go downtown and just like just walk into offices man and yeah. and go right up to the xerox <laughs> machines dude like you know look the part and just make some some copies man these things can be expensive in volume <laughs> stealing copies was such like a uh, badge of of uh alternative cartoonist 90s alternative cartoonist was like how do you get your copies from from kinkas or wherever <laughs> i still think that cartoonists are responsible for those like little card counter gimmicks <laughs> Probably. That, that stick into the xerox machine man, because there, there are there were times when i was young and fucking broke to be honest where uh i would 500 sir <laughs> you know, like a stack like this, something that would fit literally in the box that would um, contain like four or five reams of paper. And a ream is 500. Yes. And it and it's, fills it up. <laughs> and then I go, I have like 500 here, you know, on the little paper. And I'm super sweating because I'm like, <laughs> there's no way I'm going to get away with this one. You get away with it, man, because it's a ham and egger who who's, doesn't give a fuck. Yeah, they don't. And uh, what are you going to do? Start counting them? Yeah, there's a there's a lot of those uh, those great stories of, of how you get hold of those copies one way or the other. Sometimes it's just knowing somebody, you know, somebody's dad or uncle or something that works in an office, and they're like, "Yeah, you can make copies here until you abuse that privilege." Of course, but right now, I'm, I bet there were kinkos in like uh, maybe the the Bay Area or something. You know, there's like those clusters <laughs> of like where cartoonists were really like a lot of activity was happening. Where I bet, man, they'd have like a guard or something set up. They're looking at their numbers at the end of the month, and they're like. What the hell happened here? Responsible for killing some trees. Just reams man. of paper that are unaccounted for. <laughs> um, one other cartoonist who probably uses the methods uh, that you just laid out and described with the 1200 DPI black line, 300 DPI color, Dan Klaus, man. And that was a pretty successful video we had this past week, getting a hold of an early copy of that Dan Klaus Studio Edition. What a beautiful treasure that thing was. And uh, K Fabers, who have all been watching that and commenting and liking it, thank you because that is such an indicator to me. You know, the response to this stuff, you know, like I was excited. One of my notes about Calvin and Hobbes is why did we take this long to get there? And it's, there's just so much comics landscape. But whenever we get this kind of like positive affirmation, um, it's like, great, let's do more artist editions. Let's, let's do more Dan Clow's work or alternative comics work. Um, He's one of my favorite cartoonists, super influential. And when you get hold of the artist edition, that's where you really get to go to school.
it's it feels like dissecting a frog or something in biology <laughs> totally class. like like there were people on twitter who were screen capping the thing and were like my favorite part is when ed and, and jim like pull out the ruler and get, get all close <laughs> <laughs> like, like like we're like we're like we're bunk and fucking mcnulty like <laughs> at a crime scene <laughs> <laughs> it feels like it, man, and I'm not done with that book either yet. So. Oh no, man! Like it, I was like I was chomping at the bit for you to come over so that we could look at this thing at a really good first glance because I was holding off, man. But man, I I, I poured over it every day since. I have I have my copy set up on my dining room table. <laughs> that's another benefit of, of the wife being away is that it's like that's my art room now. Uh, have to clean that one up before she gets back. But it has been a pleasure going through that book. And one of my favorite parts of that video, and I think a lot of people have responded to, and you know, like messages they've sent, is going through it for the first time with no preparation. It's pretty amazing. Like it's it's like uh, a kid at Christmas or something. Yeah. Like, like what a joy that that is. And. Uh, those are my, you know, like those are the moments in comics that keep me engaged in comics is finding those moments of just joy and, and wonder. And yeah. that book is full of wonder, man. Let me tell you. <laughs> I'm just, this just came to mind, man. Uh, it was uh, when, when we were at TCAF uh, this one year and you got a hold of the, <laughs> the, the Ronin uh, Frank Miller uh, artist edition. Yeah. And that thing is at least as big as the Klaus one. It might be bigger. Yeah. Uh, huge. To the point that when you open it up, both edges of the hardcover can almost take up the space of like uh, a double bed, whatever the, right. not the queen, but like still two people could fit in it, whatever that bed is. Uh, and we laid it out man and we had to sit at the foot of the bed because that was the only the biggest right. surface to like have this thing out man and we were sitting at the foot of the bed and just like all hunched over bent over and like staring at this thing all close look at these weird sketchy figures like but but it's amazing that it works in comic form and and maybe it's because he drew it so big when it reduces it tightens up a whole lot we're having those conversations in walks Josh Simmons, who's sharing the room with us, <laughs> and he like pregnant pauses and ain't playing, and and is like, uh, uh, sh should I should I leave for a minute, guys? <laughs> <clears throat> hey man, what are you gonna do? <laughs> yeah. Man, I mean that, that'll be a good one to put under the microscope at one point. I uh, I have a cloud story, man, that I don't think that I have on record. Cool on the uh, the kayfabe channel. I'm always down for a Klaus story. And and it uh Tom Spurgeon, our our late friend Tom Spurgeon, who who we, we recently lost, he factors into this as well. Uh frankly, it's barely a Klaus story in a way. Um in twenty fifteen, the year that we won the Eisners, um, you you were not out there to collect your your trophy and, and, and I was out there, so I had I had yours and I was bringing it back. Uh but I was able, thanks to Boing Boing to swing through uh, because I was a part of a press junket. I was able to hang out for a day on the set of the Wilson movie with Woody Har Harrelson and Laura Dern. We stopped off in, I believe it was St. Paul, Minnesota. And there was a little amusement park that we were ushered to that is in the movie for a fraction of a second. And the scenes that they shot are not even yeah. in the movie. So it, like that, that's like an interesting thing, you know, and it's um, it I'm clearly part of like the comics press press junket. It's it's me. It's Tom Spurgeon. It's Tim Hodler. It's Alex Dubin. And it's uh, it's just some guy from Vice, you know, and in fact, like the other comics dudes were like apologizing to him for all the geek talk that we were doing. And I was like, fuck, fuck that. You know, and like all those dudes who I just named, they're from like an earlier generation that still has scar tissue about being a comics fan and shit. But that ain't my generation. You know what I'm saying, man? Fuck that. Don't make no apologies, you know? And even Spurge was like, you know what, Pisco, you're right. Yeah, I take it back. <laughs> um, yeah, I can imagine Tom getting a kick out of that. Yeah. So so we, uh, we go to this sweltering fucking hot uh, amusement park. I'm not quite sure, but they had to kayfabe the the name of the park, and I think that Klaus might have lettered that, like like the yeah. the lettering. And but it's not even I don't think, even think that's in a movie, um, like a sign, like a there sign, was, yeah, oh, yeah, man, like, that's like the really entry cool. sign. That's that'd be the best prop to like leave that movie with straight up. 
So they bring us in, and the first thing that's done is we go under this like under this tent, and they have a giant flat screen TV, and and um, projected is is Dan Klaus giant head talking to us the comic guys and he and it's clear he doesn't know who the comic guys are but this is like the video the canned video that needs to be made for like the comics press and he made might have made five of these fucking videos uh you know what i mean like like while he swung through saint paul minnesota right, right. or whatever the fuck and uh it was basically like being being daddy or so it was like giving us the rules and the lay of the land and like you know be respectful of the uh of, of you know this or that and, and, and don't take the photos and you know when you guys go back to your hotel you can talk about jim starlin and like <laughs> I, I remember saying jim starlin it was just like really crack, crack me up <laughs> but uh you know like th- then it's then it's now like time to watch you know the movie magic and it it's a uh it's an amusement park and everybody that you see basically is an extra everybody who's like past the threshold if they're not on the on the um crew they're they're an extra and i have to populate the rides you know what i'm saying man and it's so fucking hot it it was so hot that you know they would bring us cups of water and the the cups of water would just disappear in like she would give them to you and then you would just like throw it back quick like a fucking shot and and uh then they just like got us these like giant like mugs and they and they were like here, man. Like clearly, you guys are very thirsty. We all just got off planes, and you know how that yeah, dehydrates right. you too, you know. Um, so it's that hot, and there are little little kids on these rides. And they don't let these little kids out of their fucking rides, man. <laughs> they don't let them out, and and uh, these kids, you know. Their parents are like wherever the the fuck they are because they had to be brought there and papers had to be signed and all that. And these kids are stoked that they're going to get to be in a movie and they're going to get to like ride on rides all day until take six, seven when you see the little girl like this. Yeah, careful what you wish for. Kid. Yeah. And uh, just the whole thing was Klausian because I'm behind like the little the little, um, you know, the, the little fences that they had were the same ones at the front of like old school WWF where, where it was like the um, the little barrier that has like the rounded edge mm-hmm. with the jail bars. Like we're behind those. And um, you see like the little PAs that have like the trays full of like little waters for the little extras who are on uh, the rides. And then the PA like comes and gets a little call in the earpiece, puts the tray down on the hot asphalt full of the waters and like goes and runs and does a task for like you know woody harrelson or something like that and you're just watching like the evaporation take place of like these hot water these hot waters and you see the little kids all hot and like going like this in the rides reaching and then <laughs> and then the first glimpse of laura dern and woody harrelson that, that you see there's like mooks behind them man holding big umbrellas over their heads and stuff as they're like walking through the scene and all that stuff like blocking out what they're going to do it was it was amazing man and then we eventually like talk with the producer and we're sitting there and and i'm so unimpressed by all of it but um i was there thanks to boing boing and the idea was that maybe i'll do a comic about the experience uh but they had a moratorium for like a year like you can't do anything for like a year and i'm like fuck that like i'm not i'm not waiting a year so i'm just gonna not even like the only things i would have to say or the things we're discussing here and none of it's good you know what i'm saying but like when we're having that conversation like laura dern she comes by and she chats with us and stuff and one of the like lower rung pas or something like had a slip of the tongue and was like yeah, do you guys have any questions for Laura? And then like the maid producer lays, oh, no, 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 Laura Laura has to go. <laughs> it's, it's like clearly like we're, we're like the lowest tier douchebags uh, when it comes to the press. And like Woody Harrelson like came by, like he just sort of like walked by and looked at us like we were fucking pieces <laughs> of shit. And he did smell like weed too. I'm happy to report, man. I don't know if that shit's legal in Minnesota or whatever, man. So I don't mean to narc him out. On, on point though. To, yeah, yeah, yeah. On brand. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was thinking on the on the plane, man, because I, I never even fucked with that stuff, man. But I was like, you know, if we're there, and if Woody Harrelson is like, <laughs> we, you want to hit this? I think I would say yeah, just for the kayfabe story of it. 
Sure. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a funny thought to have on the plane. <laughs> right. Something to look forward to because it was like, also, by the way, because I had your, uh, your Eisner, my Eisner, that, that created many questions like, like uh, in, the, in the airport because, they're, you know, they're heavy objects and they're metal and they go off and stuff. And, uh, every, and you have to go through security fucking twice, man, to go to St. Paul and then get the hell back and go to your final destination, man. And everybody's like, like they, it creates a situation where they go through your shit. And what you got in your globes or something? You know, like, yeah, we won some awards or something, man. And so your 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 Eisner was like fondled by TSA like two times, man. Makes you wonder what happens to like a Tom King or somebody when they have like five in their luggage. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. I've had I've been stopped and searched for uh, like I'll have bricks and mini comics if I'm going to some convention or something, and mm. they're just tucked in the bag. And I think it must look strange on a sensor because they're they're densely, you know, like and it's, it's paper. bagged up. Right. And it's paper and you can only have 10 G's. Who's the guy who has 9,999 G's on their thing, man? And it's just like, listen, man. Yeah, I, I don't know. You always hear the stories, too, of like the, the canine units will sniff out money because I guess drugs are basically on every dollar in America. <laughs> so that, that always sets off the, uh, get, gets you some extra attention if you're walking around with a bunch of cash. That was always the thing coming back from like Canada where it's like after like TCAP or one of those shows and everybody at the border being nervous. Yeah, man. And our freaking <laughs> lily white behinds get, get, get through that line so easy, man. The last time we were at TCAF, like we went through so easy and the only motherfuckers that you saw that were pulled over, man, in like big trucks and stuff, it was Middle Eastern dudes. And, it, and, and, there was some, pro, it appeared to be some profiling and, going on. And, and it was that thing like, oh, these are random searches, huh? And we're just like, fuck, man, because it was, it was ridiculous. Like, like it was like every Middle Eastern trucker in existence was had their Mack trucks pulled over, man, and and were were getting uh getting the run around at the at the border there. I mean, you know, my pops, my pops, a very very dark skinned guy, man, like Eastern European, uh, uh Rom Romani, uh, gypsy character, man, and and they're like sort of like uh, their skin tone is like Mexican or uh like uh like Indian, you know, very dark skinned guy. And he worked at Canada a bunch and it was always a crap shoot, always yeah. a crap shoot, man. And, and it would, there were times where he was denied and would have to like call the boss man and the, and the boss would have to like come from, you know, Toronto somewhere, come through wow. and was able to, to like vouch for him and, and get him across the border and shit. Man, that would have been years ago too. Like, like before border searches were, it, it actually was such yeah. a big thing. Yeah. Yeah. I was still in high school. <clears throat> That stuff, that stuff always went on. Um, what other videos did we even post? We did the uh, what the number five oh, or classic image image year zero as, yeah. as we like to describe it with uh, Jim Lee, Eric Larson, Wills Portacio, Larry Stroman um, doing some very good cartooning in the uh, in I think like eighty nine I think is when that book was published eighty eight eighty nine so early in their careers but but lampooning some of the uh, big Marvel characters like Hulk and Thor and X Men and stuff. I was thinking about it. I don't know if it lines up, but it may have been some of Jim Lee's first X-Men work. Uh, I, I think he actually drew a fill-in before that, but it, it's it's around that time that he starts to do X-Men, and, and his pieces are X-Men based. So that's, that's a fun video. Yeah, that's a it's it's a murderer's row of talent in that. Even Hilary Bard is in the scene, man, and I like that guy's cartooning a whole lot. Yeah, for sure. Um, Al Williamson inks several of the stories, including Jim Lee, which is interesting because I was such a I'm such a mark for Al Williamson. Love is, is inking on JRJR on Daredevil. Uh, pretty cool to see him inking some of these these image guys. And then, uh, you know, is it John Severin is the centerpiece? No, Russ Heath. Russ Heath. Is it Russ Heath? Who, who does the, uh, the Tin Soldiers? Yeah. I think so. Like, that, that's the, the comments that we're getting on. The, <laughs> all right, on, all right. And Russ Heath drew the original, uh, you know, Soldier Men ad that would be in the 70s comics. So that was like the callback. It's like, you got to get Russ Heath to do the... Well, it's awesome. It's it's a great centerfold of like uh, street violence. It, it looks like Death Wish, Death Wish uh, pr promo art or something. <laughs> it's amazing. Um, so that's a fun issue. Miracle Man, your your reread of Miracle Man continues forward. Uh, a new episode of that dropped with Jim Mahfood, Ben Mara, you and Tom Scioli uh, doing the Read More comics, which is awesome. Yeah, good to just get those guys on record. Uh, the the real excuse for like doing the read more comics thing and, and to like go through a single issue of comics at a time 
is that uh, you will like I each person will kind of like identify a piece that they want to start talking about. And the conversation just goes down that, that route of like, you know, captions and comics. And then the conversation goes to that for 10, 15 minutes or something, man. So that's, that's what I appreciate about getting some cartoonists on, on the horn. I like that that direction a lot. That's one of those things I don't think about very consciously, but you will notice it sometimes. And Alan Moore is the master of that almost prose like captioning and stuff. I think Ben Mara brought it up yeah. or started it in that direction. That that was a cool piece to think about um, that I think you find throughout most of Alan Moore's writing. Right. And and just like that's but one example of like the things that get pulled out. But that's that's a thing and and like we might have to start, you know, bringing even more people on and and doing even more comics and shit to uh to just pull out these comics and then look at the medium of comics in a different light once you know, you get somebody riffing on a page and yeah. they're like, yeah, you see what's going on here? And it's, you know, just a different level of thought than that you've put There's in a lot of ways yourself. we could do that too. Um, as we continue to talk to different cartoonists, you know, it doesn't even have to be a big read. Like you said, it could be one page. You know, you could talk to them and say, you know, whoever it is ahead of time, let's talk about a page of Barnaby or, you know, whatever, let them pick whatever. But uh, just taking one page and really looking at it would be a fun thing. It would be easy if you were interviewing or talking to somebody Let's do 10 minutes on this on this page that you like. Yeah, that could be great. That's a good idea. Um, Shelton's the, the tour of heroes aren't hard to find warehouse, which was amazing. Uh, whenever we were in Charlotte, in November, we got a behind the scenes tour there with Shelton and Seth. Um, those warehouse spaces like like those are my favorite places to visit. And it's something that's really opened up to us in the last several years, just from befriending different stores, uh, different retailers. So it was cool to see that space. And I was thinking about it. That's a relatively new warehouse, comics warehouse. You know, so many of these places that we visit, they might be 20 or 30 or 40 years old. And uh, there are places that look scary to walk under. Uh, you know, it's, it's kind of propped up and leaning on, on it. That was like a new that would be like a state of the art comics warehouse probably one of the newer, especially of that size, um, comics warehouse that you would find anywhere. And uh, that was really fun. So that was a good, that was a video I personally enjoyed uh, living and rewatching and uh, long to go back there. Yeah. Yeah. Two things. One, uh, it's, it's too bad we didn't get two hours of footage there because we easily could have, and the interview could have gone all kinds of places. Yes. Uh, But the other thing is it would have been awesome to have an independent cameraman uh, with us because that would have made that possible. Uh, Cause at a certain point you want to have fun. Like you go want to live your life yeah. and the, the gimbal has to go down and you have to like start digging in boxes. Yes. You know, oh, man, the digging was incredible in that warehouse. We could have spent, I could have spent weeks there. Yeah. You know, like, like we, they had some stuff ready, but just like everywhere you look, there was interesting stuff. Um, It was cool to see the history, too, you know, seeing like the history of the Heroes Con, you know, like all the arts and programs and stuff that goes with that, seeing old signs for Heroes Aren't Hard to Find, hand-painted signs and stuff. I loved all of it. So uh, we listed it as, you know, happy 40th birthday to Shelton in in the uh, brick and mortar uh, store. And so uh, that's great, man. 40 years. What an achievement. And it feels like it's bigger and better than as long as I've known them, you know, this is as great as ever. So congratulations to Shelton and his crew and what a crew he has assembled there um, from the show to the store. It's really, uh, I think that's probably paramount. You find a business that's successful for 40 years, you're probably going to find a good a good family-like atmosphere of, of people that work there and are willing to walk through brick walls or uh, tear up brick walls to yeah. remodel a place as we heard some stories about that new shop. That's what I said, like, like upon leaving... Uh, and sort of parting words with with Shelton. I'm like, dude, these motherfuckers love you, dude. Like they they signed up. Like Eddie P with his soft hands, man. <laughs> yes. I sign up to to work at a comic shop, and then you put a sledgehammer in my hand. I'm gonna say fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I do, man. I do. It's uh, it's 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 quite a team that he has there. Yeah, yeah. Here's to another forty, man. Uh, it's gonna be fun watching that shop develop because he's able to shake and move and and he has enough skin in the game he's been in the biz long enough to see the peaks valleys to see trends and to see patterns and if you're in it that long then then you know sort of how to move when certain downward spirals happen you know how things are going to bounce back it's it's pretty cool man 
Yeah, I, I wish there were more resources of, of guys like Shelton and, and maybe there aren't too many guys like Shelton, but, you know, like hearing those insights, hearing, you know, what he's thinking, what he's planning, what he's brainstorming behind the scenes, because as you say, he's gone through a lot in those 40 years. Yeah. Um, and, and we barely got to see, you know, just just the tip of that iceberg, but uh, quite quite a quite a trip. And uh, I'm happy that we get to make these videos even if they aren't the two hour epics that we want them to be. Right. Um, it's just awesome to be able to, to share these spaces, to, to record these spaces, um, because I never saw any of this stuff for my f first 40 years of my life. Yeah. So I I'm thrilled that we get to do that. Uh, one of the things I love on this channel. Yeah. And, and like the, that like week was a crazy week because I think the week before it's like we're, we're in Kansas City and uh, we... And we dealt with basically like three giant collections. And I'm trying to think like what the, f it was Hamlin's collection. Mm -hmm. We got the video of that Shelton's collection. And I think there's like visited Tom DeHaven's house. That's right. That giant, the other giant, place. beautiful library. And it's just like uh, immersing ourselves in like all this other stuff that is just like, it's a kid in the candy shop. It really is. Uh, it really is like like these are these are whatever my dreams were for comics. They exceed it whenever you get to really get out and meet these people and see this stuff that like I didn't even know existed when I was a kid and trying to figure out what I wanted to do. You Dude, know, just just meeting you uh, here in town, you know, my my homestead was sort of like one of those things that I thought about like growing up where I remember thinking like. If I just had one other person <laughs> to true. talk to about this stuff, I would be able to effectively double my knowledge on this subject. You know I would I, mean? I would glom on to people too. Like like there was a comic book store in my college town and I knew a guy who went there and it would just be like yapping in his ear about whatever I was reading. And I'm sure that guy was like, what are you talking? Like, please stay away from me. <laughs> totally. Like, like uh, same deal. There would be like the few people who had some clue but uh even when i was young i'm like eh, they're kind of i didn't know the word vapid <laughs> i didn't have that vocabulary and but i knew that their their interests were very shallow uh and these would be you know like i'm kohai you know they're senpai and they're they're telling me to like read this or that and i'm checking it out and i'm like i don't know <laughs> i'm not feeling this man uh and then you realize, like, to this day, I still know some of these motherfuckers, man. And my thoughts have not changed. <laughs> <laughs> There's definitely different tastes, for sure. <laughs> You're so diplomatic, man. That's the other thing. I need to, like, let some of that uh, absorb into my <laughs> DNA a bit. Because I'm just like, ah, oh, like, like, I get offended. You wasted my time with this. Well, that part happens, too. There, There is some time <laughs> wasting involved. Yeah, man. I, I hit basically everything I want. I'm very excited to... to K Fabers, make sure you get a hold of uh, what is it? Uh, Comic Journal one twenty seven. One twenty seven. It's the Bill Watterson interview, and you could read it on uh, online. Um, you could find it on the TCJ site. It's a, it's one of those classic interviews, not conducted by Gary Groth, but uh, that's one of the next videos that we're going to record. Um, I have a couple things before we we sign off. Yeah, this is a big a big time for all of us who are releasing books. Oh right, yes of course. Tom Scioli's. Uh, Fantastic Four Grand Design Collection. Out. I'm going to confuse all the weeks. But okay, in the next two weeks, this is what's happening. Yours came out last week. Mine came out last week. Plain Jane's came out last week. And I, I have a few plugs for that. Yes. One, we were on NPR, which is amazing. Like, That's talk it. about, like, like you know, a bucket list item. Super excited for that. Um, and, and I've been posting links to that NPR bit. But uh, we'll be doing promotion for that. So, like, I will be at the Carnegie Library in Oakland on January 23rd. Uh, show some slides. Talk about it. Do take some questions. Unlike Laura Dern, I will uh, be fielding some questions there. Um, Cecil Castellucci, my co-creator and, and the writer, will be in LA tonight at Vroman Bookstore. Um, and she'll be in New York on the 15th at Escape Pod Comics and the 16th at Word Bookstore. So you can find all that. Follow, you know, if you're following me on, on uh, social media, I'm posting about all of this stuff, but I'm super excited. Like the response has been good so far. And How, how's the, how's the, the talk progressing? Um, it, in your mind, is it, is it, uh, career retrospective? Is it plain Jane specific? Uh, are you going to slide some 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 Street Angel pimpage in there? There's no there's no plain Janes without Street Angel. <laughs> Both times, weirdly, it's so strange how how those things repeated. 
Um, so there'll be some Street Angel stuff. There'll be, it's not going to be a big career retrospective, but I'm going to talk a little bit of shop. Um, you know, the book Plain Janes, we have like three, basically three novels are in that book. Yeah. And in between the novels, we have little pieces. One is like development stuff. So it's character designs and things. And one is walking through process, uh, script to finished pages. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that stuff. And it's, it's basically going to be, uh, you know, relatively general because I don't think it's all cartoonists sitting in that audience, but it'll cover uh, quite a bit of this stuff. So a little bit of shop talk and how I make these comics. Probably half of it will focus on Plain Janes specifically. And then, you know, a little bit of just like, I'm going to take a, a few images of like, these are some of my best images. Let me just show off. Yeah. Um, you know, I want to entertain people. So it's going to be a chance to, uh, to stand in front of a bunch of people that have never seen my work really. And uh, kind of show off what I've done and what I'm proud of. And it'll all be under the Plain Janes, you know, it'll be connected to that. But it'll be a little bit more than just Plain Janes. It'll give a little bit of how this came to be and where I'm coming from and what I'm drawing from and all that stuff. So it should be fun. I'm, you know, it's a short talk. I've done these talks that are two hours. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to do probably about 30 minutes and then do a Q&A. So it should go relatively quickly. I'll cover as much ground as I can. And I'm bringing some visual stuff. So, you know come on out if you can make it and it's free admission with a library card so i hope to see uh quite a few people there yeah that's great man uh but pittsburgh is a small town jim and and i would have put even more responsibility on your head uh on top of everything going into that show set up the tripod man put on a little lapel mic and fucking get some video for the kayfabe channel because a million more people will see it or more accurately a couple thousand more people right right will, will see it than the people who are in the crowd there and i want to see it man but Eddie P doesn't leave the house in January. <laughs> Smart man. <laughs> you know, it made me think like I, I've gone through so many things, you know, thinking of like, what do I include? What do I talk about? Um, I found the oldest drawing that I that I am aware exists of mine. Oh, that's cool. I found and I'm going to show off there. And it's, it's draw a drawing that is related to that space that I made when I was six years old and I had done a field trip there whenever I was six years old and it left a mark because I went home and made this drawing that my mother has kept all this time. Uh, so, you know, there'll be some surprises there, some stuff that nobody has ever seen before will be coming out in that show. And there'll definitely be some kind of uh, kayfabe component. I thought about doing a, a dry run, you know, like making, making a video, kind of testing it out. So someone will either record it or else we'll make one specifically for the channel because it is a, you know, it's a bunch of stuff that I do want to show off. And like I said, some of it has never been seen before. So... Yeah, I think I think some of that art needs to be. But the January over. thing makes me think of that really great art show that Carnegie Mellon had like 20 years ago. Right. The greatest comics art show I had ever seen. Uh, still, probably to this day, I think there were 150 artists in it, mostly alternative artists, and it was so freaking cold. Yeah. I remember going to that, almost not going because it was January, and it was like, oh man, it's like four degrees outside or something and then you get the feels like minus 12 um, <laughs> but turned out to be the greatest comics art show so uh that's what i'm that's what i'm in my mind you know that's that's what you're always comparing it against whatever the best references you can come up with yeah. that's what you're aiming for so i uh I may or may not still have a videotape, man, from, oh, from, from that art show. That's what the K, that's what this K Faber needs to see. Yeah. Get that videotape, man. Find it, that thing. It was like the first time I saw so many pieces of original artwork from guys like I only like, you know, read about in com in, in, in TCJ. It was such a great, sh same, same, same. You know, it was all these great cartoonists that everybody you knew, Jeff Smith, Charles Burns, Chris Ware, just everybody and all different, you know, like seeing a couple of pages from each of those guys. Different you really sizes, got it. different scales. Different materials. It was just like mind melting. That, that, that broke the, the preconceptions of like uh, how to draw comics the Marvel way. Uh, oh, you're supposed to use 11 by 17 paper. And, and like I, at that exact moment, you know, that was almost 20 years ago. Like it was like about 18 because, because I was working at the call center. So I was done with Qbert school. And I was doing everything I could to deprogram myself from the st rigid structure of like corporate comics mentality, jobber mentality. And, uh, and that was crucial. That was so crucial to see stuff like comics that were drawn with uh, Conte crayons and all sorts of different methods and materials, different shapes and sizes, color applied directly on the board uh, in some cases, man. All kinds of weird lettering. It was just like no holds barred, anything goes. 
Yeah, there was a lot of uh, permission granted after walking through that show of like, man, you can just draw whatever you can come up with. If if I, I, I don't know exactly when that came to Pittsburgh, but it's very possible because like the, the, the camera that I used, I got from working at the call center. So it's like, it could be 2002. That sounds about right. Um, I might have quit my fucking job. A few months later, like fuck the, like fuck, yeah. like 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 this is co- what comics can be. I quit working here. Like I have to like join that. I have to I have to go be a part of that over there, man. And uh, we started this conversation about all the all of our work that's coming out. Yeah, Ed, what's your book coming out, man? Yeah, yeah. So so Tom's book comes out uh, this week. Uh, I guess it came out yesterday, man. The the Fantastic Four Grand Design, and uh, next week, uh, my studio edition book is going to be uh, available i'm super stoked about it man a lot of people uh it was real fun seeing uh during during christmas um phantom made good on the people who did that special like one day purchase like fire right. sale thing and uh to see myself like tagged in all the prints that that showed up at people's houses man but uh you know we looked at the klaus studio edition book and uh, we are in a new year. It's 2020. And there are all these uh, articles that are coming out about like the anticipated books of 2020. And uh, they'll, they uh, will marry my book up right next to uh, the Dan Klaus studio edition. And it made me think about, uh, <laughs> it made me think about like last month when Eddie Murphy was on uh, Saturday Night Live and they take this like at the end when he signs off, out comes Tracy Morgan and Dave Chappelle, Chris Rock, it's Eddie Murphy and fucking Keenan comes out (laughs) and he's out there with them. And whenever they talked about this like momentous moment, they either like basically they would crop out Keenan and then and then uh, a lot of people who are like, I don't know, man, Keenan and Kel fans or something were like don't diss Keenan and like and like they would like show that and it became a meme and I'm like I'm fucking Keenan right now man. Oh, no. I'm Keenan and I get it I'm self-aware I get it but uh <clears throat> you know comics is a long game you know what we we've talked I, I can't remember if we've said this on camera but one of the great things in your artist edition and, and this is a plug for anybody that's in into these artist editions you annotate each page that's the greatest that is I would pay double for every artist edition I own to have that that feature um, I think that's one of the great innovations in yours and one of the great values. And Dan Klaus Artist Edition, brilliant, love it, great. I always wanted it. But I, again, I would pay double to have those annotations. I think that is such a great feature um, that is in your Artist Edition. And I think we're going to see that more in future in, in other Artist Editions that come out in the future. But for anybody that's on the fence, like that would be what, one of the things that I would say tips it over. It's, it's, a, it's, you know, it's, it's the director commentary, right. page by page. Uh, if you're interested in making comics, if that's part of your appreciation for these artist editions, man, that is an incredible, incredible resource. I'm I'm super, uh, you know, I'm super stoked. I'm super happy with the book. It's I had much more limited materials to you to cobble my book together. My career, <laughs> my career is basically less than a decade old, right. man. And he's pulling wow. from 30 years of stuff. Uh, so what what can I do, man? Uh, but I was thinking also like. I think Plain, Plain James is very strongly designed with the different color segments and all of that. I think uh, my studio edition is well designed, but fucking that Klaus one. <laughs> uh, who can beat that? You know what? We didn't we didn't cover it in the video, but you know I've been studying that book since then, and I was looking at like who who designed this? Is this a Kobe design? It's Dan Klaus is of the course. designer, <laughs> credited designer. Uh, it shows, you know, um, it, it's part of what separ- initially separated him from a lot of other cartoonists in my mind is that he had that. I don't know if it's an innate design ability, great eye, whatever it is. His books always look better. You know, like books have come a long way, comic books and graphic novels, in terms of their design quality. But back in the '90s, they looked terrible mostly. So when a book was well designed, and his were they stood out yeah. and uh, you know, it, it, it makes sense that he would design that book and have ideas on, on its design. So when, uh, when he went to Pratt, I mean, one of the things that I always liked about eight ball was uh, the use of different methods and materials. And, yeah. and he, at the time, you know, it's, it's one of those things where we're sort of like bound by the technology of, of, of our times in a way, man. And 
certain things just just wouldn't have worked like he wouldn't have been able to do just like a penciled comic or something but if if it was if he was the same person plugged into like a young like you know 2015 era or something like what is that version of klaus gonna put out into a comic because nobody was really using amberlith then uh zipatone was far on its way out hand lettering the uh indicias like allowing for like no typesetting um figuring out like mathematically how you could um use like one signature of color paper and then weaving that portion into yeah. the book that's you know he's making use of his pratt education one of the things that's not in that artist edition that i that i always loved was he would always have like the ad pages where he'd be selling yeah. back issues merch book collections prints stuff like that and they would all be all his hand. Right. And I always would love those things. I always thought, like, if I could get an original piece of his, I would love one of those. Because I like production and commercial art. And that stuff was production and commercial art, but totally did Klaus' version of it. Um, and showed off the design and the great the great compositions and stuff. Yeah, man. Listen, dude, we've been at this for about an hour. We have yes. a lot of videos to record today, man. You ready to bounce? I am ready to, yes. Cool. Well, uh, like, subscribe, follow the YouTube channel, hit the bell. Uh, we'll notify you whenever we have new vids available. And we're setting up some cool stuff, man, that you're going to want to be uh, aware of, man. You're not going to you're going to you're going to feel foolish, man, if you see a video that you weren't able to participate in. Yeah. Uh, and another way to keep up with that is we are I am sending out an e-newsletter e this weekend, Ed. So you all heard it. Uh, you can sign up below this video. You can sign up below any of our videos for our e-newsletter. Um, that's another way to not miss anything. Um, that's part of why we decided to try to start one is to keep everybody up to date because social media does not do the best job of reaching everyone. This is one more way to stay informed of what we're doing. Um, you can support Cartoonist Kayfabe through uh, merchandise and t-shirts available in our spread shop. Right now, everything is 20% off in our spread shop through January 11th. Uh, no password or code or anything is needed for that. It's just everything is 20% off. So you can check that out and uh, read more comics.